for me personally, I respond to that with a lot of very intense fury because I don't like that the fossil fuel industry is so evil that people are scared of having kids. Like that's how, that is how damaging and bad they are for human society that people are saying, I don't want to create life. Um, so like that, they, they are influencing as an industry um, people's decision to, to not, to, to stop creating new humans, right? Um, that really signifies how important the fight is. Escaped sapiens. In my everyday life, I'm increasingly running into people who are hesitant to have children or start a family of their own due to fears related to climate change. So how much trouble are we in realistically? And is retracting from creating life really the answer? In this episode of the podcast, I speak with Katan Joshi, analyst, researcher, and author of the book Windfall, which explores the path to a fossil-free future. We take a critical look at the systematic and structural reasons we are in this mess to begin with, and take aim at a realistic and more caring path forward. I'd really recommend watching this one to the end. Whatever the solution is to climate change, one thing's clear. It's time to fight harder. Enjoy. So to start with, I wanted to get a realistic idea for what climate change actually means. So when scientists are talking about climate change, in terms of the numbers, the degree changes, what is the damage that we've already done? So compared to a timeline in which we had never gone through the Industrial Revolution, and what are we likely to see in the coming decades? So a report came out a couple of weeks ago that really nicely outlines this. I recommend um, your listeners having a, having a poke around in this report. Um, there's this group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's not a body that does any original science itself, but it does uh, reviews of science. And basically it's like this overarching review process of the field of climate science. But they also create materials that are actually surprisingly easy to understand and read. Um, and they, they looked at this exact question, right? Which is basically what has already happened. And so they look at the past century or so, uh, and they look at a few different variables. So they look at um, the quantity of greenhouse gases that have been emitted thanks to our decisions, right? Like thanks to human activity, things we've done. Um, and they also look at um, things that were basically around before humans started industrializing. So things like the world's photosynthesizing organisms, like plants and trees and things like that. Uh, and also the planet's oceans and atmosphere. Um, now, all of those things uh, play into this thing which we call the carbon cycle, which is, is actually like this natural flux of carbon through um, the bodies of animals like you and I, um, through plants and trees, through the oceans and the atmosphere. Um, carbon actually moves around the planet all the time. Uh, what we have been doing since industrialization is we've been burning fossil fuels to generate energy. Uh, and the problem with that is that it injects this additional element into this pre-existing cycle. So the reason I mentioned the cycle part of it is, is because it's actually a really, really important and quite confusing <laughs> uh, sort of caveat for understanding climate change, right? Because what we're doing is we're adjusting uh, a sort of pre-existing cycle in a way that we can actually detect our influence upon that mm -hmm. cycle, right? Um, and so when you sort of look back in the history of climate science, a lot of the difficulty has been trying to detect the influence of humans, right? Like, so, so what, what are we doing? Um, how do we measure the impact of that and things like that? And what we've actually found is that there's a nearly linear relationship between the release by us of additional carbon dioxide into the system of pre-existing sort of flux uh, and the change in the Earth's temperature, the reason being uh, when you sort of add more of this substance into the Earth's atmosphere and oceans, more heat gets trapped. So the sun, the sun's energy hits Earth, um, you know, uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act as a sort of, um, you know, visible ceiling, I guess, uh, exactly like a greenhouse, which is where the name <laughs> greenhouse effects came from. Uh, and it, it's actually, I was a little bit surprised when I was reading the IPCC report. It's actually the first IPCC report that I've properly, you know, uh, mm -hmm. gone like page by page. I didn't read all 3,860 pages or whatever it is. <laughs> um, but I read, a, I think I read a pretty decent bulk of it um, in addition to all the sort of summaries and things like that. Uh, and it's actually a little bit surprising how straightforward the relationship is. Uh, mm -hmm. between what we do and the sort of heating that the planet, planet experiences. 
Uh, it's like this linear relationship uh, that shows the more the more greenhouse gases that we emit. Um, and so just to quickly explain what, what I mean when I say greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide is the main one. Uh, this is, you know, the sort of uh, prominent culprit of, of climate change, of global warming. Uh, but there are a few others as well. So methane, um, mm -hmm. cow farts, you can find methane underground. Um, you sort of dig it up and you burn it and it can be a fossil fuel as well. It gets referred to as gas or natural gas. Uh, and there's also oil, um, which is, uh, you know, um, sort of gets refined into the petroleum that you put into your car or refined into jet fuel that you put into a plane engine. And it's sort of oil is really sort of closely associated with transport, mm -hmm. uh, whereas gas is like power and heating in homes. And then um, coal is mostly power um, and also the manufacturing of steel. Uh, and so these three fossil fuels have been burnt on, on a really massive scale. But uh, what we've actually observed is that the consequence on our habitat on Earth has been really um, quite predictable. So what we've seen is relative to pre-industrial temperatures, mm. on average, the Earth's temperature has warmed about a degree. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is something that we can really detect. The uh, We can very, very confidently look at the consequences of that, right? So, um, you know, uh, temperature change, of course, is one of the sort of core metric here. But uh, on top of temperature change, there are all these sort of flow-on consequences that happen to the Earth. Um, and, of course, as a consequence, like everyone... Uh, with the exception of like, what is it like the four people who live on the International Space Station? Um, everybody experiences these consequences. There's really no escape from it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we sort of detect things like uh, fire seasons. Um, so uh, the way bushfires work is that you have a lot of um, dry fuel, you know, dry leaves and things like that. But you also need conditions like very hot temperatures. You need high winds um, and you also need a lack of rainfall. Um, and so climate scientists, you know, decades ago predicted that like, well, it seems pretty obvious that as the planet warms, the risk of really bad fire seasons increases. Uh, and that is actually what we're seeing. Like uh, you can actually start to detect that through the noise, through the natural variability. Uh, with other areas, it's like, it's a lot trickier. So things like uh, hurricanes, um, you know, really severe storms. Uh, but there are these new fields of science actually springing up recently called attribution science, uh, which basically says like, what's the probability that this, that this particular natural disaster would have been as severe as it, as it was if we hadn't in, in like, you know, create a parallel earth where we didn't burn fossil fuels. Um, and they sort of create this parallel earth, um, this parallel history. Like, as you said, you know, if we just didn't, you know, it, if we didn't industrialize through the burning of fossil fuels, I'm pretty sure we could have industrialized some other way. Um, that's a completely different. <laughs> we'll get into that <laughs> issue. Um, then, uh, would this disaster have occurred the way we saw it occur? Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, you know that science finds that it's extremely, extremely unlikely that these disasters are manifesting the way they are. Um, with the, it's extremely unlikely that they would have manifested the way they do uh, in that alternative universe where we didn't burn fossil fuels, which which basically attributes the severity of those disasters mm -hmm. to the burning of fossil fuels. It, often these things get discussed in this really sort of binary sort of uh, it, like an on and off switch for disasters. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, there wouldn't have been any bushfire had it not been um, for the human influence on, on the climate. Um, but of course... Uh, and then there's this sort of skeptic argument of like... Uh, We've well, always had saying, bushfires. And... Yeah, it, exactly, right? And so it's actually really important to talk about severity and intensity because these are the, these are the dimensions that we're dealing with. And of course, uh, most people prefer a less severe... Thank you. Most people prefer, prefer a less severe... Sorry, I was just getting a coffee from... <laughs> <laughs> um, most people severe, prefer a less severe bushfire to a more severe bushfire, right? Like mm -hmm. this is really... This is a really... Um, uh, it's, you're not, you're not actually, um, uh, losing anything by talking about these dimensions, you know, um, in terms of warning of the danger or mm -hmm. the severity of the problem. Uh, and so just to go back to your question, uh, which is like fundamentally, how do we actually know and understand, uh, what has happened over the past few decades? Uh, it's sort of about two... 1,400 ish with um, some error bars on either side, uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide that have been injected into the Earth's atmosphere by us, you know, by our, mm -hmm. our, our actions. 
the majority of which was sort of after the mid 80s basically after i was born um like that's like that's sort of the, the the upwards curve um and so because the curve is not a linear curve of, of emissions mm-hmm. it's actually kind of climbing upwards a lot of the problem has occurred very recently mm-hmm. uh, this is not a it's not something that's kind of just been bubbling away and getting a little bit worse each year um, it gets worse by an increasing mm-hmm. amount um that's sort of what people like they like it's not exponential in the sort of literal precise sense but it's that's kind of what people mean is like um, colloquially or rhetorically they mean uh, that it's getting f- worse faster mm-hmm. um, so what are we looking at in the next decades uh, so that same report from the IPCC models a bunch of future scenarios right this is where it gets really uh, I'm going to talk about parallel universes again because it's really uh, <laughs> it's actually quite relevant to the whole um, it's how I, it's how I sort of understand what they talk about right so the report from the IPCC actually considers uh, the different scenarios that we're going to see in the future. Uh, and it has five of them. Uh, and each of these link to a certain quantity of greenhouse gases that are added into the atmosphere. And it also uh, incorporates removals, right? So if you add a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, you can also potentially take it out of the atmosphere again. Um, that's actually a really important, as I mentioned before, carbon dioxide isn't the only greenhouse gas. There's many others, um, that cause, um, relatively severe, uh, global heating impacts, but carbon dioxide is the one that we actually know how to remove from the atmosphere. And so potentially in the future, there could be a technology or there could be a natural solution such as planting a tree or doing something else. Uh, that removes carbon from the atmosphere. Um, and uh, actually just yesterday, um, this system uh, in Iceland started up uh, and it's called, it's run by a company called Klimaworks. It's called Direct Air Capture. And it does, it, it's another one of those things that's actually surprisingly simple. Uh, mm-hmm. You expect it to be really complicated and incomprehensible, but it's a fan that sucks carbon out of the atmosphere. <laughs> Um, and then you can use that carbon uh, to, you know, like in cement manufacturing or um, you can potentially a fossil fuel company can buy that carbon and use it to actually sort of uh, dislodge more oil from underground and burn mm-hmm. more oil. So uh, not a politically neutral thing to do, um, but this is what the IPCC consider um, as a possibility into the future yeah. as well. So what that means uh, is that you get these bunch, you get a bunch of different futures with a bunch of different variables that basically end up at different warming levels for the, for the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can say, you can basically say, look, if you make these decisions, like if you, like, let's just say we just dropped all climate action today. Yeah, worst so case scenario. Cancel the whole thing. Yeah, cancel the whole thing. Don't um, care about the future. You know, yeah, everyone gives up. Um, and all the fossil fuel companies are like, sweet, you know, we can start, <laughs> we can start like burning more fossil fuels again. Um, the consequence would be um, you can actually predict that that consequence, right? As mm-hmm. I mentioned, we actually understand the relationship between uh, the action of adding greenhouse gases into the Earth's atmosphere and the consequences, mm-hmm. uh, which is the not just the temperature changes, but the sort of flow-on impacts onto uh, everything that we rely on to subsist in, within the atmosphere, right? Like um, food, energy, uh, transport, uh, our habitat, the way we live inside homes and cities all that kind of stuff, you can actually get a relatively good idea uh, of how terrible the consequences would be. Um, and so, you know, they sort of go a little bit into into those climate impacts. But, you know, the worst case scenario is uh, for a, a decent proportion of the world, unsurvivable, right? Like it, the, the temperature increases uh, sort mm. of um, go past the point at which the human body um, can like, you know, perspire and maintain like homeostasis inside mm-hmm. your body, like the temperature inside your body. Uh, that's really bad. Um, so, so you're talking average temperature ch- uh, temperatures of what, like 36 degrees or something like this on the planet? What? It really actually varies quite a lot. There's so within the IPCC report, they actually have a regional specific um, sort of document, like a little PDF mm-hmm. uh, for each scenario. You can actually look up where you live and go, okay, well, in the worst case scenario, average temperatures would be X degrees. Um, you know, uh, changes in rainfall would be this. Changes in fire danger. So would let's be this. look at Australia. What's the what's the Australian case? 
Uh, so it is. Uh, I can actually bring it up for you because I have it bookmarked, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've got my regional fact sheets. I actually, I'm going to just talk through it as well because I recommend. I I, I, rec- I highly recommend um, your listeners going to the IPCC report website. Um, it's AR6, which is the sixth assessment. I report. can put it down the bottom. Thank you. Yes, that would be wonderful. Um, but there's a section called regional fact sheets, uh, and it has Australasia. Um, and so New Zealand is in there yep. as well. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, uh, so the things that stood out to me actually, I was just, so, okay, there's, uh, three temperature changes that it looks at, right? So I mentioned we've already done one degree. That's kind of mm-hmm. like done and dusted over the past, you know, <laughs> the past century. Um, not good. Like we're already seeing some things uh, around the world as a consequence of that. In Australia, if we hit 1.5 degrees C of warming, that's also not good, right? Um, that is that is an extra half a degree of warming that, that has these flow-on impacts into uh, into Earth, right? Um, and so, um, let me just bring up the changes that we. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> Um, they're in, (laughs) they're in, uh, it's a, it's a graphic of, uh, temperature changes. I'm going to describe it because it's, um, I can also put that up on the screen. Yeah. Oh, right. That's right. I can do everything. I can. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so, so within the Australasia fact sheet, there's a, there's a array of, um, sort of four tiles that has, um, changes in in temperature and changes in precipitation. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it has darker colors for, um, the more severe temperature changes. And you can see the, the vibe that um, you can basically get from this is that the difference between 1.5 degrees C of warming and 4 degrees of warming is really, really significant, right? Um, the, the depth of the red is much, much deeper. Um, and so at the top of the page as well, um, it's also got a lot of the changes that are locked in um, thanks to warming that we essentially can't avoid. Right. So in terms of the world's emissions, there's a momentum in that system um, and it actually takes a lot of effort to, to shift that momentum and, and change the world's emissions so that instead of getting worse every year, they actually start to get better every year. Mm-hmm. Um, that takes time. And even in the best case scenario that the IPCC report has examined here, um, there's a few things that they predict is just going to happen anyway. Right. Um, so. They talk about since 1950. I, I always go back to, to fire danger because it's actually a really nice uh, example of how climate change is impacting Australia. Frequency of extreme fire weather days has increased and the fire season has become longer since 1950 at many locations. The intensity, frequency, and duration of fire weather events are projected to increase throughout Australia and New Zealand. Um, it predicts an increase in heavy rainfall and, and floods, um, increase in marine heat waves and ocean acidity, um, and a collection of other changes I'm not going to go through because I think people have probably heard, heard them before. Like, like, I think this is something that's relatively well covered, um, in, in media outlets. Um, what we really want to focus on though, is that there are two different types of changes that the IPCC report are describing in a lot of detail. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bring it up because it's, as I mentioned, 3,800 pages, but like there's two categories you can really put it into. One is what has already happened. Uh, and if you sort of pin onto the end of that, the stuff that's almost certain to happen because there's just no way we can reduce emissions fast enough to avoid it, Mm -hmm. um, without some sort of catastrophe. Um, there's wiggle room there, which we won't go into. There's sort of debates about, you know, exactly the rate at which we can reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. Um, but then the second category is actually avoidable stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so... This is, these are changes that um, are not locked in, um, changes that, that you can potentially avoid, right? So there is actually one chart I want to, um, I want you to put up on the screen, and I'll and I'll send you this. Uh, sure. I'll send you the link to it afterwards. Um, and what it basically shows is uh, not for Australia, but for the world. It shows how the world's temperature will change based on different emissions levels into the future, uh, mm. and the difference between now. And the best case scenario is some warming. That's that's not locked in per se, but it's mostly locked in. In that the amount of effort it would take to change it is very very large. Is enormous. Beyond what we could do, 
while preserving democracy and like <laughs> and justice around the world, right? Like it's okay. not we, unless you breach one of those things, um, then you're just not going to reduce emissions down to like zero in five years, right? Like it's just mm-hmm. um, uh, it, it seems like it, there could actually be something could happen. You know, there could be some miraculous like um, change in like human behavior or politics or technology. Um, that would be nice, um, but we know we know that activism um, and um, isn't that sort of strong. Changes in economics and technology, yeah. Um, <laughs> let's not get into that. But the difference between the best case scenario that the IPCC talk about and the worst case scenario is really, really big, right? Like okay. this is actually a, this is actually, and I'm talking the 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 metric I'm using here is the is the number of degrees of warming relative to pre-industrial. And and how how many? What's the size of that? That's between one point five and four. Uh, and can, so can I four, can I just ask yeah. really quickly? You know, wh- one thing that I don't really understand, I'd like to understand better in any case, is when you, I can go on holidays to Canada in the winter yep. and it hits minus 35 degrees. Then in summer in yes. Australia, it hits 40 degrees. So there's like a 70 or 80 degree natural variation. Why, yes. why does this 1.5 or 4 degree uh, difference matter so much when we see those variations uh, in yep. the world anyway? So climate scientists will be able to give you a much better answer than I can. Um, and the IPCC report also gives you a much better answer than I can. Um, but I'll give you a very brief version, um, which is basically that we're talking about a global average. Uh, mm-hmm. And the Earth's temperature actually has remained within a very narrow band on average, um, mm-hmm. which means a very tiny change to that average um, actually has flow on consequences to many different sort of um, climatic systems around the world simply because it's such a finely tuned system with so many sensitivities that turning that dial even a slight amount um, kind of causes this chaotic flow on impact between these uh, sort of very specific regional areas. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding of it. Um, Just as a massive disclaimer, my background is not climate science. Um, and (laughs) And so like I understand the very, very, very basic dynamics of a system Mm -hmm. like that, but I don't, but I can't give you like an informed climate science answer. Um, but this is something that I understand is so confusing because I too was confused by this. Uh, I was like one degree, like that's what it's like one degree difference between my apartment and walking outside, you know, that's not, that's not much at all. Um, but it's actually a proxy, uh, the global average for these actual massive changes that happen Mm -hmm. at local and regional levels. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's not I actually, uh, yeah. I, so so it's sort of a um, shorthand or like a, a reference point for climate scientists to use to describe an entire planet um, mm-hmm. with an mm-hmm. extremely large, like an extremely diverse array of locations. So can I ask? Uh, so uh, in unison. So in, so could I find individual locations where on that location the shift may be drastically larger? Or, yes, yeah, the, yeah. The, the magnitude of change itself is different between different regions. Uh, those regional fact sheets actually have really have very I see, nice I see, sort of I see. breakdowns of this. Yeah. So some regions in the world will experience smaller changes than others. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you have, uh, so, do you know, have you seen what's the worst sort of change on average that uh, any location, do you have I that? I don't or? know. No, I, I don't. I don't know really. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, the more severe impacts on on like human and animal life tend to be in the hotter regions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, countries like Australia, um, you know, India, Bangladesh, uh, sort of equatorial countries, um, they tend to they tend to really seem to get the brunt of it. In um, well, I mean, they were they already are getting the brunt of it, right? Like mm-hmm. at one point five degrees Celsius. Um, there are changes that happened, you know, to like Pacific Island nations that are, that are far more severe and serious than, um, you know, like here in Oslo, like I live in Oslo in Norway, um, mm-hmm. the changes are significantly less so, um, which is of course is a, is a pretty sort of tragic situation because, um, here in Oslo and Norway, we are far more responsible for causing the climate problem than those Pacific Island nations are mm-hmm. as, as like major global suppliers of, of oil. Are there um, locations that will actually benefit, like locations, I imagine maybe northern Canada, which has yeah. large areas of cold, uninhabited, unusable. Uh, are there countries that really shouldn't care? <laughs> from, uh, so, from it? so all countries will basically experience a net like negative. Negative. Impact. There are probably some small regions that, that experience, like 
you know, they themselves will like, uh, let's just say um, you have a piece of land that you couldn't farm on before that you suddenly can farm on now. Um, but to get to that point, um, you also have to see, you know, um, like most of your trading partners suffer extremely mm-hmm. severe, like waves of migration <laughs> and all yeah. sorts of, mm. um, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So like, you know, you may be able to like farm on some new patch of land, but if <laughs> all of your customers are suffering some, you know, like that, that goes with the reason that you got that benefit. If they're suffering some massive disadvantage, like global destabilization, um, and you know, the failure of trade and, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you can't um, use a you can't use a rail line to get your goods to somewhere because the rail line is buckled under the heat of, of like mm-hmm. um, temperature changes elsewhere. Um, basically, even the places that ha- see some small benefit, um, if you are a person and you sort of want to exist within like global society, or even or if you care society, about other people, if, yeah. Well, there's also the element of caring about other people too. Um, then, you know, you don't like, it's sort of, uh, it sort of ends up as a net. So like, you sort of see this sometimes where people are like, oh, um, you know, it's all, you sort of painting a really bad picture. Like, you know, some, some regions will probably benefit. And it's like, well, yeah, like that's gonna, that's, that depends on regions and things like that. But, um, everybody's a part of society, right? Like there's just mm-hmm. no, like it, with the exception, as I mentioned, of like the four people on the International Space Station, um, everybody else will have to deal with this problem in some way, shape or form. They need um, services as well. Yeah. We <laughs> shoot food true, up there. Actually. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They rely on, they rely on, um, you know, growing food and on land um, and transport and the taxation of like um, American taxpayers to fund rockets to anyway. <laughs> They were also yeah. born on Earth and raised on Earth. <laughs> Until there's a baby born on the ISS, I guess that, uh, that's a possibility at some point. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, uh, this this report is really, really good in that it actually answers a bunch of these questions. There's a frequently asked questions bit in this IPCC report. And I think it's actually easier to read than like the summary bit that you see is like first up. Mm-hmm. Because it's just like, it asks these questions that, I think a really, um, a lot of your listeners might be interested in. So, um, stuff like if you take, if you take a chunk of carbon out of the atmosphere, is that the same as like not emitting it or questions like, um, you know, if we stopped emissions today, what would actually happen to the Mm -hmm. climate? You know, would it keep warming? Would it stabilize all that sort of stuff? Um, these are all the questions I'm supposed to be asking you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, that one is a really good one because it basically said that that one that I just mentioned about, you know, if we stopped emissions today, what would happen? Uh, it shows that there is a really fundamental principle that the IPCC mm-hmm. report is trying to get across, which is that if you either stop emitting completely or at the very least you balance out your emissions, you know, if for every one that you put in, mm-hmm. you take one out, um, which is the net in net zero, which you'll see referenced in the IPCC report, um, then the planet's temperature stabilizes. It doesn't cool to start cooling down because you've got this like stock of Mm -hmm. uh, stuff Mm -hmm. already added. I mentioned the 2,400 gigatons. So we actually have to put, you need uh, carbon negative approaches really. If you want to cool the temperatures down, yeah, then you need then you need to actually figure out some way of removing it from the atmosphere. uh, Could could I? It's just incredibly hard, yeah. Could could I ask today, do we have the technology to do that? I mean, tomorrow if we decide, if governments got their, uh gear together and decided we're doing this now do we have the technology to do that uh yeah well i mean the the technology exists for sure um but it's just it's very difficult to scale it's very expensive um and we have been in this situation before right like uh back in the sort of 1980s and 1990s wind and solar were expensive too um and they were seen as, as as um very difficult to scale uh, and they became cheap thanks to government intervention, right? Like there were subsidies, um, there was a really strong push uh, for deployment, um, that deployment, and also some innovation and, and sort of technological research as well. Those all fed into each other and it resulted in those two technologies getting a lot cheaper. Um, and so now as a consequence of them getting cheaper, they're a lot more capable in, in sort of replacing the functionality of sort of pre-existing fossil fuels on power grids. Um, direct air capture is, is a lot more expensive because you don't get money for capturing carbon, right? At the mm-hmm. moment, there's no, there's no market for, um, uh, capturing carbon. You can sell it. Um, but unfortunately the main customer for buying carbon right now, as I mentioned before, uh, is for using it to unlock more oil from the ground, which Perfect. is sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 
so it's not a profitable it's not a profitable enterprise um on top of the fact that the technology um i mentioned direct air capture before but there's a bunch of other ones they're pretty nascent Mm -hmm. but i i find my own views on this shifting quite a lot um i mentioned a company that started up yesterday called cleanerworks um they're in iceland uh and they are actually really interesting because they make a whole point of saying we don't want anything to do with the fossil fuel industry. We're not going to sell our captured carbon so that someone can like unlock more oil from the ground. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be sponsored. We're not going to be paid for by fossil fuels. Um, so how do they finance actually... it? Uh, so at the moment, they have a bunch of corporate buyers who who want to pay for carbon removal, but who want it to be like really solid, confirmed technological carbon removal. Um, so when you take carbon from the air, it's actually really important to make sure that you bury it deep underground. Mm-hmm. Um, if you capture it into a plant, that plant just kind of stays there on the surface of the earth. And if a fire tears through it, then the carbon's re-released back into the mm-hmm. atmosphere. If someone cuts it down and burns it for power. Same thing. Carbon gets re-released back into the air. Um, or if it, if you cut it down and it decays. Um, mm-hmm. so all this, all, there are all these sort of, sort of like, it's a, it's a very vulnerable situation for, to capture a, a chunk of carbon and store it in a tree because that's just waiting to be get re-released. Whereas if you capture it using a big fan and you shove it into a big, you know, underground <laughs> reservoir, um, more expensive, way more expensive. Um, but of course, uh, that is actually um, locking it down. Like it's literally storing it in a vault uh, mm-hmm. where it's, you know, hypothetically, it shouldn't be re-released um, because, you know, you're putting it back where you found it, right? Like it came from deep underground. Fossil fuels formed over sort of millennia, um, like from organic matter that was just compressed by geological forces. Um, and so of course the ideal situation is to not emit it in the first place. The other thing that IPCC report goes into is that if you remove a ton of carbon from the air, you're not actually canceling out all the harm that it did. You're, you're, you're actually having a really good impact on temperature. Um, that, that, as I mentioned before, that's linear. Um, so, you know, you take a ton of carbon out of the air and suddenly you shift down that linear thing, linear relationship down to lower, lower emissions, but, um, stuff like sea level rise, um, melting ice caps, um, that sort of stuff is, is uh, fundamentally irreversible, at least mm. over millennia, right? Like rather than like, sort of like a, you know, a decade, our lifetimes, it's actually stuff that can't be undone. So um, that has to be taken into account, right? Like if you're mm-hmm. saying, oh, well, should I just run my coal plant and then use a bunch of fans to capture the air, to capture the carbon, or should I shut down my coal plant and replace it with renewables? Um, of course, you should be doing the second. Um, and, the, and then di- direct air capture should be reserved for everything that's already been emitted um, that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we should have avoided, but we didn't. Um, and then, of course, the really big debate um, at the moment is about uh, what should be allocated to being offset using removals um, and what should be um, mitigated by just not emitting in the first place. Um, and so stuff like if you can imagine a situation of um, an emergency helicopter, right, like a, a, an ambulance helicopter, um, you shouldn't really be like going up to the pilot of, an, of like an ambulance helicopter being, how dare you emit that? You know, you <laughs> handle. That's not no one's doing that. Right. Um, yeah. So you should actually it would make more sense to reserve that direct air capture machine to cancel out the emissions of that emergency helicopter mm-hmm. but then if someone's running a coal plant and they're like well i could replace it with renewables but i just i like money you know <laughs> I don't want to i prefer to keep my asset that i paid 1.2 million dollars for um and i can't be stuffed and no one's going to hold me to account for admitting so i'll just promise to capture the air in like 20 years um and not replace it with renewables and i'll be fine <laughs> you know that's the um that is the conundrum because that's not hard to abate we know we know how to abate um, mm-hmm. you know, power grid emissions and emissions from a combustion engine in a vehicle or emissions from a cook, cooktop in a home. We know how to do all of that stuff now. Um, you don't need to, you don't need to use offset and direct air capture. All right. So it, it seems that your solution or, or your view of the solution is some sort of a hybrid system, at least in the short term, where maybe the grid is run off renewables and maybe we have electric vehicles, but then things like planes shipping steel production those sort of things maybe you still run off uh, fossil fuels but then have carbon capture and carbon drawdown is that is that sort of the pitch you have uh so so uh a lot of the a lot of those hard to abate i you know used that term before hard to abate a lot of those technologies uh we don't know what they're going to look like in 10 to 10 to 20 years there could be technological replacements for them that come online relatively quickly. Uh, an example would be uh, 
uh, creating an aircraft that can travel between continents on Earth uh, using hydrogen as a fuel uh, mm -hmm. or using uh, electricity as a, as a sort of um, is stored in batteries as a way of uh, moving across oceans. Of course, there are some uh, physical problems that you, I think, I'm pretty sure you would have um, way more insight about than I do uh, in terms of like, you know, storing energy in a battery or storing mm -hmm. energy in hydrogen and, and stability and, and, and things like that. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, what it raises is this question of uh, do you need to continue doing what you're doing and offset it? Or do you need to reduce the amount of what you're doing um, and then offset whatever's remaining? Uh, and so I like actually really like aviation as an example of this because I talked before about technological replacements and I talked about carbon removals. But there's a third option, which is not doing the thing. Um, and so an example would be um, a business that uh, has clients uh, mm -hmm. and it flies its employees to meet clients. Do you need to do that? You know, is that essentially impossible to avoid? Uh, can you have a Zoom call instead? Uh, and, you know, in, some, in, in most cases, you probably can. In some cases, you may decide that um, you as a business, your profit is more important than uh, avoiding the greenhouse gas emissions of that flight. Um, businesses make these decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. um, should a government regulate that? Should it say, well, you made that you made the wrong decision there because you chose to offset the harm of like the greenhouse gas emissions onto society, so that you as a business could could gain some mm -hmm. benefit from it? Uh, these are not easy questions because you know um, someone else may need to fly to see a, a dying relative in a different country. Um, is their reasoning um, more valid than a business which wants to maintain um, its profit or? Um, what about someone who thinks that they're like a family member is dying, like that sort of thing, right? Like, so mm -hmm. all of a sudden, um, these moral uh, and um, societal questions start to arise for particularly within these sectors that you don't have a clear solution in terms of technological replacement or carbon removals for. Um, and so uh, something like um, manufacturing, uh, uh, like making cement, um, has an incredible quantity of emissions, right? Like this is a really, really, really huge chunk of global emissions. Um, I think it might actually be more than aviation, if I remember correctly. I need to mm -hmm. check that. Um, but regardless, it's it's a pretty decent chunk. Uh, and so all of a sudden, uh, you start to then think about the consequences and the footprint of making a building. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you need to make that building? Can you... <laughs> uh, like, Use alternative uh, materials... So, so you can see how all of a sudden uh, the areas which aren't simple or easy um, suddenly become way harder than we ever thought it would be mm -hmm. uh, because it's not a question about technological advancement or replacement. Um, it will be um, probably once we kind of get further down the line of feasibility. Of it's sort of wrapped in with morals as well and ethics, exactly. I suppose. Yeah. Um, and, you know, <laughs> are, we ready, are we ready for that sort of... <laughs> Um, that's a really, you need, you need, you, you need kind of, kind of like a healthy democracy and, you know, a sort of good faith, uh, level of like discourse and kindness and empathy and, and mm -hmm. like, uh, an ability to sort of see things from other people's perspectives and things like that. Um, I, I sort of think about aviation a lot because I'm kind of a child of aviation, right? Like I was born in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, my parents moved from India to the UK. Um, I moved to Australia in 1994, uh, and I now live in Oslo, right? So um, on several like uh, several occasions, my sort of uh, my home, my place of living has been decided upon the fossil fuel technology, the use of a fossil fuel technology and an associated release of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and so, you know, uh, like there's many people in my situation, you know, we're sort of like uh, we live away from family and um, that then creates a situation where to see family, you need to sort of commit some act of like releasing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you have to think about that. You have to be really aware of it and, and sort of face, face it, you know, head on, um, mm -hmm. instead of, uh, you know, kind of like, don't think about it, you know, <laughs> like don't consider it. Um, and so that, that really complicates, that really complicates, um, things when it comes to there just being no consumer choice available. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, like, uh, later today, I'm going to go drive to pick up some, um, like I got a, I got a thing delivered and I need to go drive and, and, and pick it up. Right. And when I was booking the hire car, um, it gives you this option to say, do you want an electric or do you want a combustion engine? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have to, you have to make a decision, right? Because the, um, you know, maybe the electric ones like, you know, an extra kilometer walk away or, 
maybe the combustion engine one uh, is like less reliable or like uh, like you have to you get you get to engage with this without really having to make massive sacrifices. Um, but with some other things, it's it's way more complicated. So um, when I talk about the shape that all of this is probably going to take over the coming decades, some of it's going to be a lot more comfortable and easy to deal with than other parts. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, particularly around transport, I think, because this is the one, this is the thing that like we sort of engage with very, very frequently. It's a huge chunk of global emissions. I think it's about a third, if not a little bit more, not as much as the power sector, not as much as coal burn, coal and gas for electricity, but, um, it's the second biggest essentially, mm -hmm. um, after that, uh, and, um, actually combustion engines, cars, um, private vehicles for, for getting around. That's just a of that chunk, it, that's the biggest chunk within that. Um, and so, uh, you know, you then also have to um, think about these things in terms of like equity and fairness and who has access. Like Norway sells a whole bunch of like oil and gas to the world, but then it also uses that money to like fund, you know, subsidies and tax breaks for electric vehicles, which, you know, I don't know, is that good or bad? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's um, that has flow on effects for the rest of the world, right? Like that, that means the deployment of electric vehicles increases, which makes it cheaper for other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, when you deploy an electric vehicle in like an area that has experienced a lot of like environmental racism and injustice over the years, because like highways were built next to towns in the US um, and they suffer like severe air pollution impacts from, from combustion engines, replace those with electric vehicles and you're adding years and years and years onto the lives of children mm -hmm. um so uh you know <laughs> like there are people who would say well it's silly to talk about electric vehicles because what you should really be doing is reducing reliance on cars um and unfortunately it's not ideal but the way that the climate change problem exists is that we actually need to be pushing extremely hard in a whole bunch of directions at the same time mm -hmm. we should of course be reducing reliance on cars because you know cars themselves are not neutral uh, as a as a is like energy as a mode of transport um a highway is not neutral um it you know it, it can destroy a community or it can uh increase access for other people uh, to a community so um you suddenly have to engage with all these questions uh that i think the key consequence is what i described before in terms of like the technological development um for the solutions to climate change they're going to be a lot more personal and a lot more tricky and moral and really sort of confronting than I think we sort of realize, even the ones that, even the technologies that are kind of ready to go. Um, and so I often talk about climate solutions very much in the context of uh, justice and equity and engagement. Um, and so um, just to give you a good example of this, uh, wind power, I started out as a, as a data analyst um, mm -hmm. working with wind turbines, right? Um, and I very quickly realized that uh, people were not responding well to the development of wind power in Australia. Right? Like communities were like, "This is I hate this. You know, I hate the way they look. They kill birds. They make me sick. Like all this sort of stuff for uh, the growth of, of wind turbines." Um, and I didn't quite realize it at the time. At the time, I sort of thought it was like a science communication problem. I was like, "You know, these people just don't have the right information. Like they need to, mm -hmm. um, they need to, they just need more science. They need me to come up with the like, you know, find the studies for them and show them the studies." Um, and it actually helps a bit, you know, like it, that's certainly a very good thing to do. Um, it, it's, it's important and it should be done, like like sort of like a science communication element. But it was on top of that, it was also a, a, a sort of issue of people kind of felt a bit railroaded, like they weren't really being involved in these changes. Um, and they felt a bit like ignored and silenced and people, you know, they were like, oh, you're calling us climate deniers, but we're actually just, we just don't like this wind farm. Mm -hmm. um, and this Is it by it they... bipartisan there in terms of the dislike for wind farms or not? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, like here where I live in Norway, um, you know, there's also a lot of opposition to onshore wind, wind power. Um, often uh, I went to an anti-wind protest, you know, just to chat to the people there. <laughs> See, like, you know, I was like, Tell me, like, why do you why do you hate these wind farms here in, in Oslo, in, in Norway? Um, and somebody was there with, like, a big Greens flag, like the big Greens party of, um, of Norway. Um, and they were there, like, you know, saying, yeah, I, I hate it. I hate wind farms because they destroy nature. They destroy the natural <laughs> world. Um, and which I don't agree with, of course, because I think that, you know, uh, as an energy form, it's actually one of the more, um, like... Uh, it, less like, impactful... Less uh, in terms of the literal impact of the of the sort of base of the turbine on the ground, and then you know the rotor itself, um, uh, and, and that that impact on like avian life and insect life, that sort of stuff, 
Um, it has some, of course, uh, but compared to like fossil fuels, it's really um, compared to like all of Norway's oil extraction projects. You know, it's very noticeably <laughs> less, less bad. Hmm. And and you know, controversially, that um, you know, the hydro. There's a lot of noise about ninety six percent hydro powered on its electricity grid. And when those hydropower plants were being developed, there was a lot of opposition to them as well. Um, very, very strong protests, um, very sort of cemented in Norway's history. Um, and so suddenly you go from um, like how I started out in, in energy, uh, being like a data analyst, um, having a very empirical focus, um, very sort of like into the science and engineering. And then you sort of add on top of that the social and cultural element and the political element, because then... That actually helps you inform how you think about the technology and the engineering side mm -hmm. of things. Um, I mentioned earlier um, direct air capture, um, which is the um, Klima Works project that just started up yesterday. They very specifically say we're not having anything to do with fossil fuel companies. Um, so they've got customers like Microsoft um, and I think maybe it was Amazon. I can't remember. Like mm -hmm. some like. Big tech companies, basically. I guess they're running big servers, right? So they actually do have huge consumption. Yeah. And actually, to be fair, like companies like Google and Microsoft are doing a pretty good job of actually mitigating their emissions too. So they, they mm -hmm. actually time the load on their servers to match um, high output periods for, for wind and solar hmm. um, because they, they can then say, well, the average carbon intensity of when we were running load on our servers was a lot lower um, because we timed, you know, uh, tasks that don't need to be done straight I away. See. Um, uh, basically put into this bucket of like, do these tasks when uh, the grid is cleaner. I, I um, see. So it's, it's not that they can control when people are accessing the internet. It's that they have computations that have to be done in the background. Right. Okay. And it becomes a, it becomes uh, a nice example of like flexible demand on grids as a way of like helping to integrate wind and solar. Um, because these because these data centers just have such huge demand, it actually has a really good positive impact. It means you can add basically add more wind and solar. So it's not just cleaning up there. Mm -hmm. It's not just cleaning up their consumption. Uh, it's actually enabling more um, renewables to come online. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, in in many grids, you also have things like hydro. You've got things like nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, you've got things like geothermal in some places in the U.S. and in Spain. Um, those things also sort of play together on grids to help um, ease this problem of um, grid integration for, for renewables. Yeah. Can I can I ask, do you, what's your position on nuclear, just since you've mentioned it? Because this yeah, sort of splits um, people on both sides. It does, it does. And, it, and I find nuclear to be really important and interesting because uh, it, to me it sort of serves as a bit of a historical example. Uh, so nuclear, when you sort of look back to forecasts of what nuclear power was going to do uh, back in like the 60s and 70s, uh, the forecasts were for, you know, by 2020, it'll be like 80% of world's power and that sort of thing. There was a lot of confidence that nuclear would sim simply continue to, to keep growing. Like it was growing pretty at a pretty rapid, rapid pace. In the 80s and the 90s, and then again in the sort of late 20, uh, in 2011, um, sort of aligning with a few of the sort of key disasters that you would have heard about Chernobyl, Fukushima, etc. Yep. But also with a bunch of economic shifts in nuclear industries, um, that growth started to slow, right? Mm -hmm. um, that growth sort of, in fact, for a long period, it was just like a straight line. The world's nuclear um, output was just a straight line. Um, I don't think that's a good thing. Um, I think that uh, it's zero carbon power and we actually urgently need to displace fossil fuels. Um, you can't do it only with nuclear, but um, it, 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 it can itself serve as a, as a really powerful tool for accelerating um, the deployment of wind and solar, even um, depending on, you know, a bunch of flexibility questions about grids. Mm -hmm. uh, but the more important thing to me, of course, is why did nuclear slow down? Like what, what was it that caused it to slow down? And could that same thing happen to renewable energy? <laughs> could it happen to wind, um, for example? Yeah, exactly. And so um, in, I've, I've, I wrote a book about... Um, you know, renewables and energy justice and technology um, last year, which is called Windfall. Um, and it's published with the new NSW Press. And I address this specific question because I talk about the growth of wind power in Germany. And what happened is wind power in Germany was for, was forecast to increase, to basically to just keep going, right? Because it was mm -hmm. growing rapidly and people were like, great, it's growing rapidly. It'll, I can assume that it'll just keep going. Um, and of course it didn't. And what happened is two things. First of all, people started growing in opposition to wind farms because the subsidies for wind 
switched from a community energy focus model to a corporate model. And that mm-hmm. meant more developments were run by corporations as opposed to being owned by local communities near those wind farms. And so people were like, well, I don't like this wind farm if it's just run by some corporation coming to my town doing it. Um, whereas previous ones had been owned by, by um, at least partially owned by um, local utilities and, and, and local um, collectives. How did that takeover happen? Because, you uh, know, the, a- the, 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 this is something I'm a bit cu- curious about. So just for to yep. be open, I actually used to work in a coal-fired power state. Actually, I think it's been pulled down in Munmora. I used to work at in Australia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. But um, yeah. as an internship when I was uh, doing my engineering degree. But um, so <laughs> one thing that I know is that if you want to build a new power station, it's huge capital expense, right? So yep. mum and dad can't go and build a coal-fired plant. Yeah. But wind turbines and solar panels are, 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 can be built on a much smaller scale. So I, I thought that this would sort of democratize um, the, these approaches. But so, so how, did, how did this get overtaken by larger groups then in, in Germany? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, that's sort of capitalism like is like a pressure that, you know, leans it more towards the corporatized side than the community ownership side, basically, right? Like corporations have more power than, than communities and collectives in a lot of Western societies. That's just sort of the nature of it. But in but in countries like Germany and Denmark, that wasn't always the case. Um, and so Denmark and Germany have, but actually both have the highest share of collectively like community owned energy, particularly in Denmark. Um, and what happened is um, a few years ago, Germany's policy shifted towards uh, basically you used to get a feed-in tariff. So if you built a wind farm, you just get cash, right? Like you just, you get money um, for every kilowatt hour that you're putting in, which means it's a very guaranteed, it's a set number, set um, payment for each, you know, amount of kilowatt hours that you put into the grid. Very, very good for like a small community that needs to get returns very quickly because they've, they've put this money in and they don't, they just don't have like a big pot of money that they can just kind of play with, right? They need to get, they need to get returns mm-hmm. very, very quickly. What they've shifted to is an auction model now. So, so everybody bids in, whoever has the lowest bid uh, for their um, wind farm project wins and gets and gets that, mm-hmm. that guaranteed amount. But of course, the corporation is much better at bidding into that thing because they've got the administration, they've got the engineers and the experts. They can bid at much lower mm-hmm. um, amounts. So it just kind of naturally leans towards corporations. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think the balance is right in Germany there. Um, obviously, you need some of that because that accelerates action and it also mm-hmm. accelerates the cost declines. That's a good thing. Um, but it also um, disincentivizes community-owned projects, and that's a bad thing. And that in itself is having a slowing effect on the growth of onshore mm-hmm. wind power due to protests. Um, so it is now, like like it is in here in Norway, it's more popular to, to oppose onshore wind than it is to support it. Um, the other thing uh, that's worth mentioning um, is that you actually need to build new transmission lines to transport wind from windy areas to populations and load centers mm-hmm. where people are demanding electricity. Uh, and tra- people hate transmission lines too. Uh, and there have been some really major protests against transmission lines in Germany. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> they sort of ended up paying billions and billions of dollars to bury them. They still got opposed, mm-hmm. of course, you know, because it's not about the transmission line. It's about like, you know, some company just like rocking up and just being like, hey, everyone, I'm building my stuff and you can just, I don't really care about what you think or feel. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, uh, both of those things together have resulted in um, a really, really astonishing slowdown in onshore wind growth okay. in Germany. Uh, Germany would not have hit its climate targets in 2020 uh, had it been uh, without COVID-19. So the Mm -hmm. impacts of COVID-19, particularly the drop in transport emissions in Germany, resulted in Germany hitting its climate targets. This year, in 2021, it's probably going to be above its climate targets. Um, It's going to miss its 2020 climate target in 2021 um, because... (laughs) Because transport is starting to increase again in Germany as they mm-hmm. as they sort of vaccination increases and, and cities start to reopen. Um, that is a really, really bad thing. Um, so part of that reason is that um, Germany began shutting down its nuclear plants um, in 2011, right? After the Fukushima disaster. Mm-hmm. Germany was always set to to wind down its nuclear fleet, um, mm-hmm. even before Fukushima. That was but it was accelerated. Was... Exactly right, yeah. Um, and that acceleration itself has an impact on um, the way coal and gas operate in, in mm-hmm. Germany. What should have happened is that n- massive amounts of new wind and solar should have offset that effect, right? Mm-hmm. That's not happening because of community opposition to um, wind t- turbine projects and to and to transmission line projects. 
So there's actually a common theme between both of those things, right? Like a lot of people would hear those two stories and go, oh, well, Germany's silly for shutting down nuclear um, and it should never have relied on renewables. Alternatively, someone might hear something like that and say, oh, well, great, you know, nuclear should shut down and we should be, you know, relying more on renewables. But there's actually a common element between the two, which is that the way that those technologies are developed uh, should be done in a way that brings people on board, that brings along their support. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, obviously with nuclear, it's a lot more complicated because there's like these, you know, sort of cultural elements in Germany around like decentralized power. um, Mm -hmm. And, you Mm -hmm. know, you sort of trace it back to like the sort of 70s and 80s, um, particularly around like distributed energy and, and, you know, the way corporations own power and energy and things like that. Um, But fundamentally, um, you know, you should actually be, even with nuclear, um, you should be putting way more effort uh, into bringing communities on board um, and ditto with wind and solar because they're just as vulnerable to having that S-curve effect that I mentioned that nuclear saw, um, you know, mm-hmm. in the previous decades. Um, I constantly worry that nuclear that um, renewables will suffer the same fate, mm. right? Which is that people like me, you know, these sort of like aging renewable advocates will be like, oh no, we thought it was all going to go fine and we'll be sort of bitter about it for the rest of our lives. But we actually need to understand <laughs> why... <laughs> You know, oh, when I was a kid, everyone loved wind and solar and now everyone hates them. Like, I don't want to, I really don't want to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that actually uh, a lot of our success for ending the fossil fuel industry hinges on making sure that that, that's done right. But economically, they are actually uh, competitive now, right? So it seems, it seems like that fear won't be realized if if things continue on the economic side. Yeah, it depends on two things. So, so, so in terms of economics, um, uh, I mean, they're only getting cheaper. Uh, it, that's certainly a very, very good thing. You know, um, they, they're going to start sort of leveling off, I guess, in terms of like the cost reductions. Um, solar probably will get a bit more cheaper than wind before it starts to level off. But the problem with that is that um, cost reductions don't necessarily actually lead to faster deployment uh, mm-hmm. because deployment depends on a, a bunch of other factors beyond beyond cost. So. There's, there's the community element that I just mentioned. There's um, there's like regulatory elements like connection um, disagreements. There's actually in Australia, that's a big part of why wind and solar are starting to slow down, seeing a, a major slowdown as well. Um, uh, there's also the element of um, uh, this effect where uh, wind and solar both um, generate at times that vary with their resource, obviously when it's sunny and when it's windy, um, they bid in a, a much lower wholesale price the mm-hmm. consequence of that is that when they're generating, um, they actually have the effect of pushing pushing price down. That's a very uh, good thing if you pay. That's a very good thing if you pay for electricity. Um, your electricity bills get cheaper, but it's actually not a good thing if you generate electricity because you get less money. <laughs> so I see. So they they have to bid the saying that they can. <laughs> so the idea is that they bid saying I can supply you with this amount of power on that date, and yeah. they have to guarantee that. And so they have to bid because they don't know when the wind's going to be blowing. They have to not quite. It depends on the contracts that the that the generator is is involved okay. in. So some of them are exposed to wholesale price, which means they suffer this impact of of um they get paid less when they generate, which is not good. You want it as a generator, you want to get paid more, right? Like you want money. That's why you're generating electricity. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them are on on contracts, so it actually doesn't matter, which is fine. Um, but the upside of this is that. Uh, there is now uh, an implied incentive for renewable operators to begin operating with storage. Um, and so it doesn't matter what type of storage it is. Um, you know, it could be uh, you produce hydrogen and then burn that hydrogen later on. You could store it in a battery. You could um, pay for a pumped hydro thing to pump hydro to, to pump water up a hill and then release it when you, when you want to generate whatever. Um, mm-hmm. There's an incentive for um, renewable generators to start, you know, instead of only generating when the resource is there, store it up when there's excess and then re- and then release it when mm-hmm. there's when there's um not enough being supplied to the grid um because they will make more money that way um they get they get more money the more they el- integrate their technologies better into the grid <laughs> mm-hmm. which is a good thing so what that means is that the cheaper renewable energy gets um the more you start to ease a lot of these problems they're not fully resolved you still need to integrate like you still when you get to like you know 70 to 80 percent renewables or even 90 percent renewables you still start to encounter like you know say like long periods where there's like no wind and sun so you need to have some sort of storage that lasts for like multiple days 
um, that's going to be a different thing in, in many different countries. Um, and like I mentioned, the political and cultural elements as well, mm-hmm. um, they apply just as much to integration of renewables as much as they apply to energy technologies like renewables and nuclear and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so like <laughs> you, you have this really interesting effect. Uh, sometimes there can actually be a negative impact of having ultra cheap renewables, which is that um, a developer might be incentivized to do like a really big, cheap, horrible project they don't care about. Um, they don't do a particularly good job of like doing an environmental assessment or like a community engagement mm-hmm. thing. Um, they're just like, whatever, this is cheap as chips, you know, solar panels are just like um, cardboard to us. Like so they just plow down a forest and then... <laughs> chuck it to gigawatt. Yeah, like like that sort of stuff, right? Um, you get these sort of cowboys. They're, they're, they're exceptions. They're, they're not like, they're not the norm. Um, renewable companies <laughs> generally actually do a pretty good job, um, I think. Yeah. Uh, but the exceptions tend to be the ones that get the most coverage and the most attention. Mm-hmm. Um, so they still shouldn't be there, right? Like they still shouldn't be doing bad stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and so uh, a similar, similar thing, I think, will happen with, with electric vehicles. Um, they're going to reach price parity with combustion engines in the next sort of three or four years, like 2025, 20, 26. Um, it'll be cheaper to, to purchase an electric car than it will be. To it's purchase, definitely cheaper to run car. them, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. You, you, you consume less energy when you... When you mm-hmm. um, That's something I wanted to ask energy. about. So if you compare in terms of energy consumption, because you're, you're offsetting the carbon emissions to the power station, it... If you take that into account, are electric vehicles better for the environment? As in, you know, is is the electricity generation in a power plant and then uh, running the car off that more efficient than just burning in the engine of the car? Yeah, in the vast majority of places, even if you were to charge your electric vehicle from like, if you were to just drive up next to a coal-fired power plant and then plug, you know, <laughs> like plug it directly into the coal plant, <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be slightly lower emissions than if you were to have mm-hmm. a combustion engine sitting in the front of your car, right? Because, because of the efficiency. Because, yeah. yeah, you're driving around a generator. You're, you're carrying a generator in the front of your, <laughs> in the front of your car, right? And, you, and you're burning fuels. Like it's like, they have improved a lot, you know, like the efficiency of combustion engines has been pretty wild uh, in terms of how it's improved over the past few decades. That's good. But um, it's still, you know, <laughs> it's still, uh, it's just, uh, um, having like, thousands and thousands of tiny generators instead of <laughs> uh yeah and the other thing that's worth noting is that uh when you uh have an electric motor um it actually uh uses less energy to 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 move your vehicle from one place to another um mm-hmm. simply because when you convert a fossil fuel to energy you have to create a whole bunch of heat and noise uh in the process and that's sort of wasted energy um like mm-hmm. almost about two-thirds of that energy ends up as is mostly heat and a bit of mm-hmm. noise uh and um i guess you don't have to truck around a huge motor so in in, the weight of the the motor but batteries are pretty heavy too that's worth that's worth right right um uh so but but fundamentally like you 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 just sort of use less energy so so the total system if you have a fleet of a thousand combustion engine cars and a fleet of a thousand electric cars that all drive precisely the same distance uh the electric the electric fleet will use, you know, about a third of the total mm-hmm. energy as, as the as the fleet of combustion vehicles, um, just because converting, like, you know, the conversion process from electricity to to the forward motion, the propelling of a vehicle, um, is a lot more efficient. Um, mm-hmm. That's why they're silent, right? Like, and that's why, um, you know, you sort of don't have like cooling mechanisms and stuff like that. For, mm-hmm. Uh, like you have in a cooling mechanisms, like you have in a in the um, coolant in a in a combustion engine. Um, so uh, that's really impo- That's a, actually a really important consideration because it means that um, not only do you get lower emissions, um, well, in the case of an electric vehicle, um, fundamentally zero emissions from the operation uh, of, the, of the vehicle, uh, you actually get a much cleaner um, and lower lower energy system. Um, reducing demand for energy is actually a really important and useful thing. Um, in addition to making it flexible and shifting it around um you could you can actually i mentioned the data center example before um of you know google doing computations at times when renewables are high but you can also do things like um if you purchase an electric vehicle um you plug it into the wall of your garage um and uh you get paid by the grid operator to discharge your battery when when um, there's some sort of supply crunch, like a power line goes down and suddenly you need emergency supplies mm-hmm. and you're part of a scheme that says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll happily plug my car into the thing and you pay me, you know, 10 bucks a uh, watt hour or whatever. Uh, no, 10 bucks a, like a kilowatt hour or whatever. Um, 
uh, and the grid operator might be happy to pay that, you know, to stop people mm -hmm. from having blackouts um, or to stop it from having to restart the entire grid all in one go um, or to control the frequency of the grid or something like that. So um, uh, all of a sudden, it option, you can't do that with a combustion engine, right? Like you mm -hmm. can't go, oh, okay, well, I'll just use my combustion engine to I'll put, <laughs> put the fuel back into the system. Yeah, I think someone, I think someone actually did do that at some point. Like they, they put a, someone did a mod where they used like a combustion engine to, to, to turn a generator and then use a generator to power the electric <laughs> vehicle. And it's on YouTube somewhere. It's quite funny. Um, yeah. But, but I guess, I mean, this sort of a system where you have a distributed, uh, both a distributed grid and then all of these batteries plugged into the system, then you're averaging. So maybe you don't have sun over there or, or it's not blowing over there, but over the entire system, uh, those fluctuations are averaged out. And I guess you, you end up with a system that's very predictable, which is essentially what you want. Yeah, you can predict wind and sun output. Um, and and the, more, the more time and effort you put into these integration things that I've, that I've gone through, the fewer the instances of supply crunches, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the more rare they become, uh, and the lower the probability um, that you have to basically face them, right? Mm. So, the larger the system so is. is mm. Yeah. So this this happens. This happens, or it already happens in electricity grids, right? Um, they plan for things based on their probability. Like, what's the probability that every trans major transmission line is just going to collapse at the same time? Pretty low. Um, what's the probability that um, a storm is going to come through uh, and destroy like one particular backbone um, of the transmission line? Also pretty low, but. You know, it happens. It happens every few years, right? Mm -hmm. um, in Texas, they sort of went, okay, well, what's the probability of a, a major freezing event that would freeze gas pipelines and gas power plants and freeze up wind turbines um, and, you know, cover solar panels with snow uh, and destroy coal mine supplies um, because it's just so cold? They were like, well, that's pretty low. Uh, and then and then it happened in February this year. Because of um, climate change. <laughs> yeah. And it was one of the it was one of the most severe um, power loss events um, in America's history. Uh, people died. Um, many people mm -hmm. died. A lot of people died because they used their cars. Uh, it's so tragic. Like they used their cars uh, to try and heat their homes. Uh, um, and they didn't know that the, the that carbon the, monoxide or. Mm, yeah, um, uh, and so it's just so it's so sad. Um, but of course, you know, this is the, the these are the questions that grid operators are facing all the time with their infrastructure questions. Uh, integrating new technologies like wind and solar into the grids are fundamentally just extensions of the same project that's been going on for decades and decades for like the entire past century as we've built up electricity grids around the world. Which is like, what type of probabilities do you want to deal with? Um, what are you going to do to make to protect your people who are attached to the grid, um, to make them safe, uh, to make the power reliable, to make it affordable? You know, particularly for people like vulnerable groups who can't afford expensive power. Um, how do you make a system that that protects them? And of course, having machines attached to that grid that release greenhouse gas emissions just fundamentally, to me, falls under the same headline, right? Because that is a danger to the to the people using mm -hmm. power on the grid. Climate change is a danger to the people using power on the grid. If every time they turn their laptop on um, or turn their light on, they're releasing, they're causing, you know, um, a greater quantity of coal to be consumed, that's a risk to them. That's a danger. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a sort of a design question um, for energy systems uh, that is a really important one. And, and people, I think for a long time, it was understood to be like an optional one. Like we, we can kind of just leave the climate <laughs> and greenhouse gas thing, you know, um, like all these people are saying that we need to make some change, but we can kind of just leave it and I think it'll be fine. For the future. Um, <laughs> yeah. But of course, this is a compulsory transition, right? Like there's, there's just no, there's absolutely no way around it. Mm -hmm. um, and in, you know, people get into fights about what specific, what specific technologies can do what. Um, and a lot of them miss the, the undertone, the sort of bigger picture, which is that uh, it doesn't really matter um, we need to do what, something what <laughs> yeah well, um, well, and yeah on that on that note can i ask um so so far the discussion has been at the level of the grid or you know technology or what corporations are doing what governments are doing actually we haven't touched on governments too much but um just a quick question on as an individual, how important uh, is consumption? 
is is everything I do washed out uh, essentially by the big players, or is it important that I, as an individual, stop flying, you know, go vegan or vegetarian or whatever the um, the things are that I can do locally? What what impact do those have across the population? Yeah, I actually didn't mention diet very much, but it's it's it sits alongside aviation as a really nice example of of um how tricky it is to to come up with like one for one replacements where people don't experience any change to their lifestyles whatsoever. Um, actually, you need to make some changes that you're going to notice, right? Like you're going to feel it um, to reduce emissions. And that's because uh, farming cows um, and farming um, sheep, um, both of those creatures release a lot of methane um, when mm-hmm. you're standing there in a field eating food and then burping out, burping and farting. Um, methane is a greenhouse gas that when you add it into the atmosphere, it has the same warming effect that carbon dioxide does. Uh, it's referred to as biogenic methane, uh, and mm-hmm. it, it just means like from animals and stuff. Like <laughs> it's just um, a fancy word for um, farting and burping creatures, um, including yeah. humans included. In fact, um, and so uh, you know, a lot of this uh, is going to hinge on um, making changes that are actually quite personal and quite and quite. Um, mm-hmm. We sort of certainly will experience them as, as something real and noticeable. Um, and they're really confronting, uh, particularly for, you know, I it, like you the same, but like I come from Australia. Australia is a very high meat consumption country. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, but, I, but we but we sort of uh, like decided to really massively reduce our consumption um, of those two things um, uh, when we sort of moved away. And it's been really noticeable, you know, like you sort of, mm-hmm. you don't miss it, um, but you feel it, right? Like you sort of, you're like, okay, well, like I don't have a steak for dinner as a normal thing um, yeah. it's like a very rare thing um and then um dairy is the other one that i <laughs> that i'm so confronted by because um dairy is just like i love milk and yogurt and mm-hmm. butter and cheese like it's such a huge it's such a huge but there are a lot of emissions very high emissions associated with those things um mm-hmm. so that's the one i really struggle with um in terms of my personal sort of decision making thing um like most of the world i haven't flown on a plane for um Long time. Well, because, for people who yeah. want to make a change along these lines, but who mm-hmm. are struggling, you know, my own advice would be to pick one thing rather than try to do everything perfectly. But yes. w- yeah, do you definitely. do you have something that you would recommend for people who uh, yeah. are struggling to? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of things that you can do that aren't that aren't um, uh, changing your emissions footprint, but that have still have a strong impact on emissions. So, so an example would be uh, taking your superannuation uh, out of a bank that funds the fossil fuel industry, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and making a real show of telling people around you and very specifically telling the bank it themselves um, why you're doing it, um, because fossil fuel projects are suddenly losing a lot of their ability to be financed. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, that's because there's growing awareness of the fact that greenhouse gas emissions cause climate change. Uh, and uh, a lot of these projects are really starting to feel it. Um, and the reason is, is that banks are like, well, we're not going to lend to you because we just had a thousand customers call us up and tell us that they're taking their money away from us because they mm-hmm. don't like that we're funding this coal mine. Um, and it's it's really, really clear um, and it's really, really noticeable um, what impact that is having Um so many coal plants in the world are just like you know, planned coal plants are just dropping off because mm-hmm. no one's willing to pay for them. No one wants to lend them money. Um, they're, they're, that in itself feeds into itself because uh, investors um, and insurers are like, well, I'm not insuring you because like you're obviously not like these banks won't even lend to you. So why am I going to insure you? Um, why am I going to invest in your project? Um, I'm not going to get a return because there's so much risk associated with you now. Um, that all stems uh, well, that mostly stems from um, a lot of consumer-focused action. Um, yeah. So it's called the divestment movement. And, that, and that's mm-hmm. basically um, money that you have, using it wisely, um, storing it wisely, um, making sure that it's not going to kind of get plucked out of your account and, you know, mm-hmm. is like used as a base for lending to, to like fossil fuel projects. Um, not plucked out of your account, but you know how like banks would of course. Yeah. use it. But, you know, yeah, so... Um, uh, that's a that's a really really effective one because hmm. we can it, and the reason it's so effective is because we can detect its de- detect detect its impact on fossil fuel hmm. infrastructure around the world and you don't um, detect it in the the change in your lifestyle I suppose at least locally in time can, can I can uh, I no. ask hmm. can I ask um 
I realized that you have to run off. And so I wanted to end on something slightly more controversial, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> um, what is your view? So I, I'm having more and more conversations with people who are saying things along the lines of they don't want to have children because uh, of the impact of having kids on the environment or because they're afraid of bringing in, uh, children into a world that is going to be impacted by climate change. What is yeah. your view on on that direction of thinking? Yeah, so, so um, uh, <laughs> I'll give you a brief answer. Um, there's a long answer that we could have a second, <laughs> second podcast about. Um, but fundamentally... Uh, my, I have a lot of wariness of the um, population control movement, right, of, of mm -hmm. history, of the past, right, um, because it, it was very strongly associated with um, eugenics and racism, um, particularly around, you know, looking at um, developing countries. My family is from India. I have Indian, Indian ancestry. Um, and, you know, India was always sort of brought up as an example of, like, they're breeding so fast that they're causing their emissions to rise really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, of course, India is also an, impo in a, an impoverished country, which means each new person uh, was consuming far less in terms of like, uh, you know, energy and resources compared to someone like me, uh, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in Australia, like my emissions footprint was, you know, three Off or four times larger than my, than my cousin in India. Um, so <laughs> like suddenly you get into this weird math of like, um, you know, should we somehow make the population of India not grow as fast as it is? Um, how would you do that? Um, and sort of the more modern line is like, well, we need to empower women, um, you know, sort of give like education, um, uh, you know, family planning, access to contracept contraceptives. You should be doing all of that anyway. Um, that should not be an emissions reduction um, plan like, you know, like building an electric vehicle isn't an emissions reduction plan. That should just be a fundamental component of society, right? Um, and that would probably result in population not growing as fast as it would have otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I think that it's actually really important to completely decouple this from, from questions of specifically uh, family and life creation um, and, you know, kids and babies um, at a personal level because it starts to get really ugly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I, I sort of, um, I still have people who message me and say, how can you as a, as a, as a climate advocate have kids, right? Because I'll tweet about like my kid um, yeah. and they'll be like, well, I can't, I'm so disappointed in you. Like I thought you would know better than to have kids. Um, and that is grounded in the emissions footprint of, of deciding to have a child and the emissions that child will have. That child should not be born into a cage where they're forced to use fossil fuels, right? Um, like that is a, that is a systemic problem. Um, and it's not going to change by not having that kid, right? Mm -hmm. If you just, if you say, I'm not going to have a baby, um, the system still exists. Um, emissions still exists, like reliance on fossil fuels still exists. Um, and so I think people should continue making choices with, you know, full knowledge of, um, the system of emissions. The second part of your question though, is really different, right? Which is about the fears and anxieties people have about the direction the future will take. Um, that's a, a, a sort of um, almost a grief or, or like a, a worry or an anxiety about the climate impacts that are locked into the system, right? The societal changes that will bring about um, the physical impacts that people who are young now will experience that you and I will probably be dead um, before we experience them. Um, all those things are, actually, I think are really valid and meaningful concerns, right? Um, and if someone makes the decision for themselves to not have kids um, on those grounds, I have a lot of respect and space for that because I don't think that from the same logic that I just brought out for the previous answer, I think that you should respect someone's right to not have kids. Um, <laughs> and particularly if they're, if they're driven by this fear and anxiety. For me personally, I respond to that with, a lot of very intense fury because I don't like that the fossil fuel industry is so evil that people are scared of having kids. Like that's how, that is how damaging and bad they are for <laughs> human society that people are saying, I don't want to create life. Um, so like that, they, they are influencing as an industry um, people's decision to, to not, to, to stop 
creating new humans, right? Um, that really signifies how important the fight is, right? Mm -hmm. um, those people who feel that, that's really genuine and raw. And I don't really want to like yell at them because you shouldn't yell at them. They, they are going through um, a really um, important and meaningful process of thinking about the future and thinking about their own decisions in their lives. Um, but at the same time, when I hear it and I see it, I'm like, okay, I'll fight harder. You know, I'll, I'll yeah. continue. <laughs> I'll continue. Um, I'll continue to do what I do um, with even more, as more passion and strength than I than I currently do because I don't like that they're doing this to people. I don't like that they're um, making people like kind of forcing them into these corners. Like, um, there's nothing I can do. You know, like this, we're all kind of stuck on this trajectory, and it's like. No, we're not stuck on that trajectory. We've kind of just been bullied into into believing that we are. Um, mm -hmm. And so a lot of the stuff that we talked about when I talked about like grid design and electric vehicles, oops, sorry. A lot of stuff, I nearly dropped my water off the table. <laughs> I'll start that <laughs> sentence again. Um, a lot of the stuff that I talked about, we talked about like grid design, electric vehicles, all that sort of stuff. You can deploy it really soon. It can be, it can be much faster than we currently think it is but it's being blocked and delayed by people who with like bad intentions who want to protect their industries. Uh, and that is why people feel such grief uh, and anxiety because they see what has happened over the past few decades and they're like, nothing's happened. Emissions are still rising. Like I mentioned at the start, you know, it's getting worse faster. Um, it shouldn't be. Um, and we, but we know why it's getting worse faster because these industries are actually really good at doing what they do. So yeah, I just, um, I want to end that on like acknowledging the the real sort of emotions that people have on that, particularly like the sort of um, worrying about climate impacts into the future. I don't have a lot of sympathy for the don't have a kid because it creates emissions um, because I think that's a cop out. Um, and I think a lot of people use that as like a bad faith argument because they just, they just don't like Indians breeding or whatever. Um, but the, but the grief and the anxiety part, I'm like, yeah, I get it. Um, but you know, if you, work through that and you want to join, um, you know, the sort of effort to bring about this technological and societal change even faster than it currently is, is, um, due to, then that's really good. You know, um, then you can, then you can help try and change the situation so that you're not feeling mm -hmm. that grief and anxiety. So your, you. your, your response is really to channel that into a productive direction because when I, when I hear on the first point, not on the second point, but on the first point, when I hear people saying these sorts of things, I, it, it sounds very passive and pessimistic. And it's talking about the, the damage that the average person has on the environment, but you don't have to be the average person. Mm. There, can I just ask, I, I suppose you have to run now. So can I just ask mm. a very, very brief, is it possible to have a negative uh, carbon uh, footprint as an individual in the, in the Western world? Um, oh. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. I guess it's possible. Um, you, you'd have to figure out some really wild carbon removal. Um, it's just hard to extract, as I mentioned before, it's hard to extract carbon from the air. You need a lot of technology and, and systems and pipelines and if you can figure out how you as an individual can take your ton of carbon and get underground into a reservoir and pump it down there, um, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so um, I, I, yeah. I have some ideas, but we're going to have to turn that into part two, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'd love, I'd love to have a part two. That sounds good. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's uh, reconvene at, at a time when you, you've got a nice chunk again. And it, it's been an absolute yes. pleasure, Katan. You are yeah, absolutely welcome back on. Thanks for having me. Really good chat. Escaped Sapiens.